I'll tell you about how I told you the guy's arm that I thought was cauterized that wasn't. Um, the, the other story that I have that really makes you want to recheck things and do the full blood sweep to look at stuff. I was working with a group of very well-trained people. I was the most junior person on the team. Um, the, they were working. I was just there as a support um, role. A guy had gotten shot by a 5.56 five, round from a house. Uh, that's uh, like a 223 in the civilian world, like a little bit of a glorified 22. That's what your M4 assault rifle carbine things are. Um, they go super fast. They put holes in things, but they don't make a big wound cavity. He had been shot in the leg, somewhere around the knee. Um, another guy had been shot. So there we had a guy down and this guy was providing support. We didn't have that many people. Um, I went out to him um, and he said he was fine. I looked at him. I didn't see any bleeding. I saw the entry and exit wound. Um, everything looked okay. I kind of do my circle around to where the, try and get the other guy drug out so we can kind of render aid to him. And by the time I had come back, it was probably a good 40 minutes because time just goes fast. This guy had bled so much through this wound that I didn't see any bleeding from that he lost about half his blood volume, passed out, and damn near died. Um, we luckily were able to get a tourniquet on it, get him in the truck, and haul him across town to the ambulance. Then he did okay, um, but lesson learned for me. You know, I talked to him afterward, after action report, and we're like, shit, you know, we're sorry for the language. I'm like, man, I, I know I wouldn't have let you have done that. I would have pulled you out. Um, he says he he really he he really wanted to provide support there on that one corner of the house that wasn't covered, um, but we we talked and we were like, well, you know, probably should have put a tourniquet on, um, and that would and I would have left him in place working with no medication with a tourniquet on board, and and that's how we would have done it. But the moral of the story is, you got to check everything. I didn't fully appreciate the severity of that wound. Um, and because that artery had spasm there in his leg, it had totally like really occluded itself and I didn't see any blood pouring out. So I was like, okay, you're, you're okay. You're injured. We're going to fix you, but let's take care of this active shooter guy in the house, this injured guy. And then I'm going to circle back to you. So you, you, my point to you is you really have to keep an eye on these injuries. Okay. And you're going to be very overwhelmed um, when this happens. I'm overwhelmed and I do this stuff frequently and I'm, I still get all worked up and I have to tell myself to calm down. Any questions, guys? Do you do rescue breath when you do CPR? Yeah, so, you know, uh, what is the American Red Cross? They kind of just changed. And I believe, depending on the age and depending on if there's one or two providers, it's I use like two breaths and like 30, 30 pumps. And the, the bottom line is it kind of doesn't matter. You just got to don't stop. What's more important is the pumping of the heart. So we don't want people to stop doing that. And you got to get some breaths in every minute or so. So about every 30 compressions or every minute or so, you're going to kind of do the head tilt chin lift and get a full, you know, breath of air into the lungs. Let that person who's injured's lungs totally expand, oxygen exchange, and then let them kind of collapse back down. We kind of forced the general public to know all these numbers of 15 presses for two breaths for kids and 30 for adults and two breaths... But the bottom line is you want to keep the heart pumping. You want to keep air exchange going. And typically the error people make is they stop pumping on the heart while they're giving the breaths. And that's the worst thing you can do. Okay. But I would encourage you guys all to take a first aid course to where you actually get a CPR card. Learn how to do CPR. Learn how to use an AED. Those little boxes we put the stickers on and it zaps them. It'll do all the work for you. All you have to do is stick the stickers on and push the button. Um, there's AEDs that you need to learn how to use. There's basic CPR that you need to learn how to use. There's how to pull someone out of the water, get the air out of their lungs, get the water out of their lungs with air, and then so you can get air in their lungs, like the drowning victim stuff. Um, and that's really it for basic first aid. There's the tourniquet stuff. And honestly, what you just heard was probably more than you'll get in an American Red Cross first aid course. But they do didactics every few minutes, which we haven't done quite yet, but hopefully we'll take a break, see what time we have. We'll work on moving people. We'll work on maybe making a litter. We'll work on just how to roll people over. We'll work on how to get someone to stand up, how two guys can carry one guy, how three guys can carry one guy, how four to six guys can carry one guy. Um, we'll learn on, maybe we'll learn drags on boards or, or blankets or jackets. 
And then we'll learn like litters where you turn a sweatshirt with some sticks into some sort of support structure where you get to pick someone up and kind of carry them. Those are all important things. But right now, kind of wake up, take a break, 